Fellas, fellas, I know, I know, I messed up. I said I was going to do these things every Saturday, and lo and behold, what did you get last week? You get a big fat tub of nada with the extra zilch on top. Now, I have a very good reason as to why I missed last Saturday's update video. You see, in the previous week, starting from about Friday evening and ending about Sunday evening, the collective Canadian internet took a massive shit and died. Roughly about 33% of it, to be more precise, because that's roughly how much of internet monopoly Rogers has in Canada. So if you were a Rogers customer, you now had to go outside and play with dirt and sticks. All the boomers were happy because they got somebody to play with, but us, not so much. And even with this collective internet outage, it was still not the reason why I didn't make the video. You see, I have a friend, perhaps my only friend. His name is Tim. We started a channel about 10, 12 years ago when we were in grade 11. It's a gaming channel and we were riding on the hype of the rise of gaming channels back then. And since that day, we have been arranging little recording sessions, perhaps once every four months. And that recording session is when we take anywhere between one to two days off our work, we clear our schedule, we get together, and we do nothing but play games and record content, make memories, and it is perhaps the most fun I have during the entire year. So it just so happens that usually when we make these recording sessions, they fall on a Friday and Saturday. And during one of these recording sessions, we do so much screaming, yelling, and nonsense that there's no way I would ever be able to produce a report video without sounding like a dumpster fire. Especially since for the past few recording sessions, we've been recording the Batman Arkham series, and we do a lot of bad Batman impersonations. We come into recording with perfectly working vocal cords, spend the entire time making Batman impersonations, and come out of it sounding like two prepubescent twats. And it is worth it. Now, the only thing I can offer to you to make up for this blunder is to take a look at a content that we've sacrificed our vocals cords towards on our website. And of course, in this video, I'm gonna be covering two weeks worth of progress. This particular recording session wasn't actually all gaming though. This was a little bit different this time. You see, I've been working on the Artec Rise primarily from the script perspective, rewriting the script over and over and over again until I hone in on something that sounds relatively usable. And it just so happens that recently I've been noticing that I make a lot less revisions and the script is starting to settle down into something that could very well be used. So I figured, you know what, let's uh, take a gamble. Let's record the dialogues for our characters uh, for a couple of scenes so that I have some live material to work with. And that is exactly what we ended up doing for about three and a half hours during those two days for our recording sessions. Of course, we recorded those dialogues before we turned our vocal calls into a tarmac. And what was most surprising is actually how much time it took us to record our dialogues. I was actually expecting to blast through the whole thing and record, um, what is it, 120 pages of script within the, what, three, five hours? But we have barely gotten through the introduction and a little bit of a buildup after exposition. It was a lot of work. Of course, I did capture the recording session. It's gonna be uploaded to the conceptbay.net website, so you can actually listen to us, record, crack jokes, try to figure out how to get the dialogue delivery just right, uh, rewrite some of the dialogue lines, try to hone in on what this whole thing's supposed to sound like. I think that's where most of the work ended up going into, trying to figure out what our characters would sound like and what would make for a natural delivery for a particular line. We actually ended up rewriting a bunch of lines specifically because we heard that they didn't sound all that great once you start vocalizing them, once you start speaking the actual dialogue. So this was uh, definitely quite a bit of experience uh, uh, and it really shows me how much time dialogue recording is going to take for this project. Anyway, so now for chit chat, why don't we take a look at what we've been doing for the past two weeks on our games.
For the past two weeks, I think Dreadtail has gotten the most attention in terms of features and props. We're still trailing towards getting some sort of a vertical slice up and running, some sort of a minimal gameplay that can actually start and end uh, a game you can play all throughout. So what I decided to do is handle one of the most main mechanics, which is the flashbang and the flashlight. So these two props would actually be made out of the props we've already made before. The battery, the can, the flashbulb, and um, uh, maybe some extra wiring just to get uh, the object looking like it was quickly put together in a DIY fashion. This also meant that we're gonna reuse all of the materials we've created before. Nothing really needs to be retextured. Nothing needs to be recreated. Pretty much the only addition that I had to do is the wire. Now with the inventory system already in place and uh, being structured the way it is, adding new items is actually just a complete breeze now. All we have to do is provide the scene of the object we're adding, the icon that's gonna be shown in the inventory, and some passive information like the name of the item, the ID of the item, and of course if it's a item that has multiple uses, showcase how many uses there are left and what is the maximum amount of uses this item offers. From a design perspective, the flashbang and the flashlight are pretty similar looking. The only difference was the orientation of the tin can. Uh, so the flashbang was more vertical to give it kind of like a camera flash sort of look, a very tall, very wide shape. And uh, for the flashlight, we went with a more traditional horizontally held flashlight shape. And of course, there are no hands in this game. I didn't think this project is going to be big enough to warrant rigged and fully animated hands with all the object interactions. So we're just working with floating objects. I think that is perfectly fine for a small game like this. Aside from being able to wield the flashlight and the flashbang, another core mechanic of this game is crafting. Very simple crafting. There's not going to be a huge amount of recipes. It's just the core items that you need to create to be able to survive the night in this game. So since crafting was now on the table, I figured I would finally handle the crafting user interface and crafting mechanics. Uh, we already have the workbench in place. All we have to do is allow the player to interact with it to bring up the crafting interface and craft some items based on the ingredients they have in their inventory. Now, for this one, I decided to place the crafting inventory inside of the player, the player's inventory. It allowed me to have easy access to the player's inventory dictionary, which allows me to quickly scan it for whatever items are inside of it and uh, figure out whether or not the player has enough ingredients to craft an object. Now, honestly, I could have had it in a separate user interface uh, and I could have just had the workbench talk to the player and get the inventory that way. Wouldn't have been that much big of a difference. Um, it was just a convenience thing. I figured, you know what, it's a small game it's fine, we can put the crafting interface to the player. It just allowed me to quickly uh, rearrange the inventory and the crafting interface side by side so I can see them both together at the same time. Of course, if the interface was in the crafting bench and the player's inventory is in the player, then I can't view them both at the same time. That's honestly, it's kind of just a, call it a bitch convenience, all right? I was just being a bitch and I wanted to have something convenient. Um, I could have put it into the the crafting bench and I would have been just fine. So since it's a small game, the crafting is handled by the player. Uh, we have direct access to the inventory. So the next step was to build the actual crafting interface. I decided to go for a very simple D-Box container, which is going to be displaying the object you can craft on the left and the list of ingredients, the icons for those ingredients on the right. I also didn't really want to build the crafting items from scratch, meaning create a separate button for each crafting object uh, by hand manually. I wanted to automate the whole process just again for convenience sake. Just program the whole inventory once and then let it populate itself with all the objects you can craft. And of course, to achieve that, I had to create a dictionary of recipes, essentially just a list of objects that can be crafted and the list of ingredients that are required to craft that object. Now, we already have both the player's inventory and another dictionary called item database, which is essentially a list of all the in-game items that the player is capable of storing in their inventory. And this item database would actually come in quite handy. You see, we don't need to duplicate a whole bunch of data, uh, mention the same items multiple times in multiple different dictionaries. We can simply work with references. We have a dictionary, which means it stores data via key value pairs. I have a key called flashlight. 
flashlight. The value is a dictionary containing additional information about that flashlight, like its name, its icon, its scene, its uh, other statistics, anything that I need uh, to use with that item. And all we have to do is make the crafting system, the crafting bench, uh, simply talk to that item database and say, can we borrow some icons from here or some information? Can we borrow some text? I don't need to duplicate the same information across multiple dictionaries for multiple mechanics. They already have this central location where they can get all the information about the item they need. So that made our recipe book, uh, our crafting list, very easy to set up. All it is is just a dictionary containing a key of the item we'd like to craft and an array of the keys of the items that are acting as ingredients. That's it. No icons, no names no need to be duplicated it's all already there so all I had to do is set up a bunch of these key value pairs uh, a key for the item and an array of ingredients and the interface the crafting interface right in the beginning of the game in the ready function will simply scan go through that dictionary loop through that dictionary and then populate the crafting interface with as many items as we can craft according to that recipe book that's it the whole process is automated and i don't have to spend time creating a separate button for each new craftable item and i can add new craftable items very easily now I can just create another key value pair in the code and that's it it'll just handle the rest for me this type of module approach to user interface to inventory to dictionaries to quest uh, quest systems dialogue systems has been really fascinating to me because it allows me to create vast 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 games without having to hard code or manually program each and every single little thing and the funny thing is that it's fully modular i can just rip it out from one game and shove it into another one of my projects and i'm good to go by this point i've done the system to death so many times that there's really no more room for innovation uh when it comes to the basics of how to handle a system like this now, since we're working on the recipe book, it meant I have to now establish some of the objects that we can create so I can test the whole crafting system. I had this idea for an object, uh, a custom item the player can craft, a DIY pry tool made out of a cross beam, a lead pipe, and some duct tape. And I thought, hey, what perfect time to implement this object into the game. We're working on the crafting system. We got to test the crafting system. So why don't we go ahead and set this up? So I quickly modeled a very simple uh, pry tool. We popped it into Substance Painter and we textured the whole thing. I even went to the project with the duct tape to borrow the duct tape material so I could just pop it into this one. Since the pry tool had very clearly been wrapped in duct tape, I could have just used the same exact material without having to create a whole new one. And the interesting thing is we still needed to create the raw materials out of which we would have created this pry tool, which means we needed the lead pipe, we needed the cross beam or the iron bar, and uh, technically we already had the duct tape, so we don't have to worry about that. And I think I got lucky because I had textured the entire pry tool as a whole uh, right away, and only then decided to break it apart into the pipe and the cross beam. So when it came to texturing the pipe and the iron bar, all I had to do is just make a copy of my Substance Painter project uh, and uh, substitute the model and simply use the same exact materials and same exact effects uh, for all those individual components as I did for the pry tool as a whole. So I think that certainly saved me maybe an extra hour of texturing. So this means we now have three new objects that we can add to the game. We have the pry tool, we have the iron bar, and we have the pipe, which we can now use as our ingredients for a recipe. Now to display that recipe, I wanted to use icons. So I had to, of course, create the icons uh, for our flashlight, for our flashbang, and for the pry tool, which basically meant just popping into Blender, uh, applying the base color material over the items that we've just modeled. I didn't really bother applying all the textures like normals and uh, roughness and metallic. To be honest, the icon is pretty small. You won't be able to tell the difference anyway. So base color was more than enough. So all that's left is to simply align the angle of the camera and uh, disable the rendering for the background and voila. We get a nice icon representing the item in our inventory. Now for the flashlight and flash bang, I actually wanted to illuminate the light bulb. So in Blender, I had to apply a material uh, a separate material to the flash bulb and gave it a little bit of an emissive uh, property just to get it to glow and of course in the post processing uh, tab I had to enable bloom so that the light actually looks like it's a very bright light 
and of course to separate the crafting menu from the inventory menu and just to make it uh, more thematic i figured some sort of a blueprint backdrop might be appropriate for the uh, recipe entries and the good news is that the texture that i created for that blueprint backdrop was also perfectly fine to be used on our actual piece of paper blueprint lying on the crafting bench so now that i've defined the additional items in our item database dictionary in the singleton i had defined their icons their names uh this basically meant i could now set up the actual crafting recipe book so for the time being this is only visual there's just a little bit of code that iterates through our recipe book dictionary and uh, creates all the appropriate menus but they don't actually do anything once we press on them it has been a little while since we've done some real modeling on uh, locations of the game so i figured i'll take a short breather from programming and just uh, do some modeling on one of the locations you're supposed to find uh, in this forest. This location is supposed to be a old rusty windmill. Uh, it's a really tall location. It's one of those locations that the player is supposed to mark on the map and be able to dart towards whenever the black smoke rolls into the forest. It's a scripted event that happens two times a night and it's essentially a very thick wave of smoke that rolls through the forest, uh, of course increasing the paranormal activity, which means if you're gonna stay in the fog, you're gonna use up most of your resources resources if you have enough to actually make it through one uh, and if you don't want to waste all your resources you got to take shelter across uh, several of the tall locations scattered throughout the forest locations like the overland pipe structure the windmill the water tower the really tall telephone poles or if you're feeling risky you could technically stick within the fog if you locate a street lamp and wire up a battery to it so it provides enough light to last through the scripted event of course in that case you're gonna have to deal with the oncoming uh enemies paranormal enemies are gonna be running at you a la alan wake style i think with these tall locations i am especially not worried about texturing them too early on because it's it's fine i mean these are pretty passive objects we can texture them quite literally at any point in time and they're very easy to texture and there's really no moving parts at all so we can work with the very simple block meshy designs or even just model the whole thing up but just don't texture it and not waste time we don't want to deal with you know getting bored with the project because we've been doing nothing but modeling and texturing for hours and hours on end so this sort of stuff i'm going to leave for last one particular note about this object is uh, I specifically separated the windmill uh, head from the windmill body and also the windmill blades so that I could make them spin. Uh, just a very slow, very simple spinning in some passive wind. Uh, and of course, once the thick fog rolls in, it's going to be almost kind of like a storm. So I would want this windmill to uh, spin up and get a little bit violent. Who knows? Maybe it'll start spinning and the players have to kind of watch the blaze and not get decapitated. Something along those lines, something more dynamic. So it's not just a static object. It's really more of a cherry on top. Having sized and implemented everything into Godot, I did see that there was something missing about it. And that's when I realized that to give it more of an abandoned look, I should plaster this thing full of skewed and dislocated old boards, wooden boards that used to be, I guess, the body, the surrounding scaffolding for this uh, windmill. And now it's all old and dilapidated and some of the boards have loose screws or others have just outright started falling off the damn thing. Continuing to ignore the crafting code, I decided to finally make the flashbang and the flashlight actually work, at least work while we are holding the object. So the flashbang was the first one. We've added a light source and we did enable shadows uh, in the flashlight. Usually the directional light or the spotlight in Gadot is prone to producing some artifacts, some banding artifacts, uh, when it's being used as a flashlight with shadows enabled. So it's usually used for environmental lighting and uh, with that lighting being baked after all. So it's not really meant to be used as a flashlight per se, but so far, I haven't really spotted the same artifacts I would spot in my other projects. I am not sure what's happening, uh, but I can open any one of my other projects where I'm using a flashlight 
um, as a flashlight, using a spotlight as a flashlight, and I would see banding, especially when you get close to some of the surfaces. Now, of course, with the flash being implemented into the flashbang, I also had to implement the limits so that the flashbang can only be used an X amount of times and then discarded. That's really the whole spiel of this game. Uh, a lot of the objects here are single use, and I wanted to focus more on giving the player plenty of resources in order to promote the idea that they have to craft and use up these items quite frequently and try to communicate to the player that they don't have to hoard and save up the objects for the very end of the game. There's plenty of resources to go around. They just have to engage with it. So we got the flashbang, which provides you with five flashes uh, as long as you craft it using a uh, fully charged battery. And we got the flashlight, which slowly decreases its uh, battery capacity as you are using it. Now, I did think that the flashlight range and brightness was a little bit a little bit underwhelming here, so we do end up increasing it later on. The good news is that now that we've implemented the lighting for the flashlight and the flashbang, we can now use these things as weapons, which means we can now start working on enemies who are going to be evading these flash beams and uh, getting damaged by the flash of the flashbang. Now, the primary goal of this game is to survive the night, and that means you have to choose one of the abandoned locations as your stronghold, and then outfit it with the defenses to make your last stent to survive the night. So that, of course, meant that we reached the point where we have to program our flashbang and the flashlight to have the ability to be mounted to a wall and pointed in a particular direction. So that's exactly what you see happen here. This mechanic allows you to put the flashlight into your hotbar, look at a surface, pin the flashlight to that surface, and then point the flashlight in whatever direction you want. To represent the angle, I simply use a basic CSG box, uh, made it real thin, and uh, stretched it out uh, using the vector, which was kind of a pain in the ass to figure out and in the end it was super simple and I don't know what I was complaining about but um, uh, the, the whole system just allows you to see where the flashlight is going to be looking at allowing you to point it at whatever opening door frame vulnerable entry point that you would like to defend in turn. Now, of course, once you pin the flashlight, you can still take it off and put it in your inventory and uh, continue using it as a, a personal defense unit. So I wanted the player to have a little bit of flexibility there. Maybe the player is being chased by one of these monsters and they know that there's a location nearby that has one of these flashbangs installed at the doorframe. So they run past the doorframe. The flashbang, of course, wouldn't react to the player. I'm going to leave that alone. I don't want to troll the player that hard. And of course, the enemy will run through. The flashbang will explode it will damage the enemy or the enemy is going to go away and maybe the player says you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna grab this flashbang because i still need to get going and i don't have any other defenses on me right now having done that and still ignoring the crafting code i decided to handle something that's been kind of put off for a little while now uh, implement the batch of sounds, actually the second batch of sounds that Noah had sent me for this game. You remember Noah, right? The genius who's doing the sound effects for the Anglo project? Yeah. So uh, we decided to team up on this project as well. It's, again, it's a very small project. I can make this thing all by myself, but having recognized the absolute phenomenal quality on the sound effects that Noah has brought forth on the uh, Angular project, I figured, you know what, let's um, let's maybe take this one on as well. And uh, that takes off a giant load of work off of my shoulders. And uh, of course, the overall quality is going to rise. And, you know, if the project actually does well, we'll just share in the plunder and that's totally fine. Now, majority of the content for this process was pretty much just me defining an array, preloading a bunch of sounds into that array, and then triggering those sounds when the needed event takes place. So pretty boring stuff. Instead of watching that, why don't you actually take a listen to the sound work that, uh, that Noah has brought forth to this project so far? Some of the sounds are still missing, but what is there, oh, just take a listen.
do. I'm going to tell you this once. Make friends with an audio engineer. Make friends with a sound effects artist. Holy crap, this sounds so cool. All right, all right, all right. I've been ignoring this for long enough. Let's actually handle the crafting system. Realistically, nothing too difficult. All it is is um, when our code creates the crafting button for each entry in the recipe, not only does it instance the button, but it also establishes the signal, the signal for button up. When you let go of the button, the item is supposed to be crafted. So the signals would all be established automatically and we programmed it so that uh, every signal is established with a unique item key. So when you press a button, the function that is triggered by the signal will receive a custom parameter indicating which object you're trying to craft. Now that we have the object ID, we can go into the recipe and fetch the array of all the ingredients. After that, it's just a matter of iterating through that list of ingredients and then going into the player's inventory and double checking, do we have enough of each item? And of course, if the recipe involves two of the same item, we had to make sure that we account for the inventory slots where the first item was matched so that inventory slot doesn't get matched the second time. So if the recipe requires three tin cans, it's not gonna mark the same exact tin can as a, a criteria for all three of them. Of course, after the loop has verified that all of the prerequisites are present, all the raw materials are there, the second for loop starts, which essentially goes through the player's inventory again, but this time it destroys any item um, that is a part of that recipe. So that's it. If uh, everything goes well, uh, all the items have been matched, all we have left to do is to instance the newly crafted object, populate into it uh, or the maximum amount that you can use. Of course, for the items that do have an amount, like batteries or flash bulbs. And uh, that's it. It's the same exact object as we can already interact with. The player just uh, presses a button or holds the button to pick it up into the inventory and off they go. Easy peasy. Modular systems for the win. It's kind of like getting shots as a kid. All that crying and yelling for a tiny little prick. Anyways, that is all the progress we've made on the Dread Tale for the past two weeks. Hopefully the next video updates will go without interruptions. So why don't we move on to the next project? I gotta say, Angular hasn't received as much attention and love as I wish it did for the past two weeks, but it all comes down to the fact that I'm hitting this particularly challenging aspect of the game, which is, well, literally designing the gameplay. What is it that the player is supposed to be doing in this game? What is the game? What are we playing here? So, uh, part of that has been defined in a document which I call the gameplay loop document. Uh, essentially, it's a very simple outline where we specify the goal, the immediate goal of the character, of the player, the obstacle reaching to that goal, and a solution to that obstacle. This is how I designed the gameplay loop on paper. But now that we're trying to implement that gameplay loop uh, in practice, I find that that's not enough. There's so much empty space in this level that could be filled with a lot of very interesting things for the player to do. And the document side of the gameplay loop only outlines the core components, the narrative, the progression of the story, the secrets that are being revealed and the narrative that is being presented. All of that is fine and all. We have to go through that and define it and showcase it to the player. But then what happens in between all of those components? Well, this is where we have to enrich the gameplay. We have to add in between obstacles and solutions that the player has to go through. And some of that stuff, I have been pretty much um, only been able to come up with as I'm working on the level. Some of the obstacles are very simple, like platforming challenges where the player has to get from one side to the other. There's no way for me to come up with that stuff while I'm looking at a blank sheet of paper, you know, an empty document. Um, these kind of ideas come to me as I am working on the level design. And here's a, an example of that. I thought this was a really interesting gameplay mechanic. Essentially in this level, 
there is a mural. This mural decorates the entry, the giant doors into the observatory, the educational space of this alien civilization. And the mural gave away way too much that this was an alien ship way too early. I wanted that to be more of a reveal. I wanted the player to doubt a little bit. I wanted to plant seeds of deception, so to speak, uh, by having the secondary character talk about uh, this possibly being a human ship and this place looking highly religious, which means probably all the nut jobs of this so-and-so religious group that's detached themselves from the government, etc, etc. And of course, that's when the big reveal that this is an alien ship and aliens aren't commonplace in this universe. So, what's the idea that I came up with? Well, I wanted to have the mural but the mural was out of place. It was giving away way too much way too early. So what I had decided to do is I had decided to shatter the mural. I had broken it into a uh, hundred little pieces using a uh, quick effect in Blender and offset all of the chunks of the mural using a little bit of scripting. So as soon as the game runs, it just offsets all of the chunks in 3D space. It of course also makes a record of the original positions of all the chunks so that we can um, reassemble it. And that's when the idea hit me. What if we make the chunks of the mural be the solution to a platforming section? And when the player just enters the ship, uh, as soon as they get access to a jetpack, they can use the chunks of the mural to platform from one area to reach some sort of an inaccessible location. Now, at some point, as the player goes through the level, the ship will be repaired, relaunched, uh, it, will, it will awaken from its state of dormancy, and it will auto-repair the mural, and which is where the big reveal comes in, and which is my solution to how can I both keep the mural and make the mural be out of place. Well, in the beginning of the game, it's gonna be shattered, and when it actually matters, when, uh, when the player already finds out that this is an alien ship, the mural will reassemble itself. Now, when the mural reassemble itself, that means the player cannot use it as as a platforming solution because all the chunks have flown back into their rightful place so well what how can i come up with this idea while i'm staring at a blank sheet of paper uh trying to come up with a gameplay loop i can't this sort of stuff comes to me as i was developing the actual level design also, excuse me, because I have to close the window because a skunk just exploded somewhere in the neighborhood. Thanks, asshole. Literally. So yeah, how am I supposed to really come up with that idea? Which I myself find it to be interesting because it's a clever way of reusing the same location uh, to reintroduce a challenge into a room where that challenge didn't used to be. So really, how can I come up with this stuff while I'm looking at a blank document trying to figure out what the gameplay loop is. I know what the gameplay loop is from the standpoint of the narrative because I wrote the script. I know what has to happen after what. I know what events have to transpire so I can design the gameplay loop pertaining to that narrative uh, just fine. I can imagine it in my head. But these sort of ideas, man, that's almost pretty much just improvisation. So this is um, where I'm having the most trouble at the moment, just coming up with interesting gameplay mechanics uh, while I'm working on the level design, or working on the block mesh. The initial temple room ended up getting divided into three sections. Uh, you guys remember how big the temple room used to be before, and uh, I thought is just too much. Uh, too much empty space, uh, too much space where there's nothing to do, and too many distractions. So I decided to divide the temple room into three sections. The player is going to be entering the middle section in the beginning of the game, and then the sides, uh, side sections are going to open themselves up uh, when that becomes appropriate. Until then, having a small room is going to allow me to make the player focus, concentrate on this one immediate location where we can teach the player the basic mechanics, um, lay down some narrative foundation, uh, lay down the mystery, and uh, have the player maybe explore and try out their mechanics for a little while. That's pretty much what we have to work with at the moment. So 
the majority of the trouble is just um, coming up with content, really. I mean, we have the narrative content, but we need also the gameplay content. The stuff that sits in between the narrative, uh, maybe some of it is tied to the narrative, some of it is just pure gameplay. And uh, the way I want to go about this um, is in a very UI conservative manner. I don't want to have a lot of key prompts and key commands um, that make the player utter something or contemplate on something or um, make a menu pop up or have too much HUD. I want it to be immersive and to make it more immersive, I have to limit how much user interface I'm using. So this is uh, where the project's sitting in right now. I've been working a little bit on the level layout, kind of moving some platforms. Uh, in this temple area, there's supposed to be a suspended temple city uh, from the ceiling. And of course, the player will require a jetpack in order to actually reach it. Before the player gets the jetpack, the player will be uh, going through the motions uh, of the narrative, kind of getting acquainted with the story, laying down the, the premise, everything that needs to happen before the player can be given free reign so uh, this is where we also have some limitations the player doesn't have access to the upper levels until they get access to the jetpack so we have to also think what can we place into this level that will check off some check boxes from the narrative standpoint from the from the gameplay standpoint teach the player a few things before he even gets access to the jetpack that's a whole another mission a whole another uh, game mechanic technically technically now that i think about it um one of the game mechanics is the um, uh, tablet decryption tool um i don't think we get it get access to it too early on but maybe we might want to change that maybe we might want to rewrite that and give the player access to it earlier on so that they could um immerse themselves in the story, read some tablets and notes uh, from the, the the civilization that ran the ship, uh, get a little bit acquainted with how the ship runs and get a little bit acquainted with the mindset of these uh, these creatures. Uh, of course, that is all narrative uh, gameplay. There's, there's no clever mechanics or puzzle solving unless we come up with some. So that is something that I'm currently preoccupied with. So not a whole lot of progress to really showcase. All you guys really see here is me moving around some props, moving around some blocks, defining um, the level geometry with some very simple shapes. It's all part of the standard block meshing experience and I'm, I'm pretty much just grazing the surface at this point. I did notice that uh, I tend to come up with better ideas after a few iterations, which may seem like an obvious thing. You're supposed to create multiple variations of something before you make up your decision. For me, having done solo dev for such a long time that I would uh, usually settle on first, maybe the second thing I would create in terms of a prop design, uh, it's kind of putting me out of my element. and. Uh, it's for the better because I am satisfied with my later attempts way more than I'm satisfied with the initial ones. And I think I've seen a video somewhere about agile development uh, when people talked about um, the best thing a studio can do is to redo the project twice or maybe three times, which is, it sounds like a crazy thing to say, but technically from my experience, I can see how that would resonate because I have created the same game mechanics like the inventory system, the dialogue system, the quest system, task system over and over and over and over and over and over again so many times across all of my prototypes or many of my prototypes that by this point I know what to expect and I create that system from scratch so every next iteration, every next attempt of me creating that system simply makes it faster and easier so that's when, that's that's what they're talking about when they're saying um, you know the best thing the studio can do is to remake the same progress it's like sure but you're still spending the the first initial learning phase uh, to get a get a hold of the mechanics and learn how to do them and figure out the possible solution. So that is where Angular is standing. It's kind of a frustrating stage, but uh, the one fun thing that I did end up doing was creating the mural reassembly uh, scripted event, which is uh, essentially when the mural that we see in the starting area reassembles itself back as a whole, revealing what the mural image is. So as I said, it gives away too much the fact that this is an alien ship too early. So I ended up using Blender's shatter tool, scatter tool, cell fracture tool. It's a 
it's not enabled in Blender right away. You have to go to plugins to find it. This is called Cell Fracture. But you simply just select a mesh and then go to object, uh, quick effect, cell fracture, and it will pre-fracture your object based on uh, whatever criteria you decide to give it, like the size of the cell, the segments, uh, adjacent uh, dimensions, stuff like that. So uh, the whole effect resulted in uh, a pretty decent chunk of um, cells. I was a little bit uh, concerned about performance, which to be honest, I thought Gadot wouldn't be able to handle it because it's got a maybe a hundred, maybe a couple of hundred of individual components uh, floating around. All of them have to have static collisions too, so the player can jump off of them. I thought Godot would croak, to be honest. I thought they wouldn't be able to handle this many objects, uh, transforms being moved and animated at the same time, but whew, boy, was I wrong. And I'm pleasantly surprised that it's actually capable of handling it because this means I can actually use this effect in a couple of places. Uh, it's a very nice looking effect. It's like the ship self reassembling, um, uh, repairing itself. I can practically hear the choir, the low basses of uh, the male voices and uh, ethnic drums playing in the background as it's supposed to be this grand reveal, the, the something weird happening to the ship. The ship is coming back to life. The player is uh, the spark that gave the ship back its life, right? The spark of life. So I thought that was a very, very nice surprise that Godot is capable of handling that just fine. So this is all the progress we've made for Angler. Why don't we move on to the next project? So here we are again, our tag rise. Uh, what we've handled in the past two weeks was a complete overhaul of the entire dialogue system that we've had placed here before. Now, this dialogue system was made before I had created my web-based dialogue editor, Dialogi. So this dialogue system was meant to kind of exist by itself before I had committed to that whole editor and the problem here is that this dialogue structure and the web-based dialogue editor structure do not at all match. They are completely unrelated. The way they process data and the way they organize data are completely two different worlds. Now, I wanted to make my life easier in the future when I'm creating these dialogues um, for the quests, for characters talking to each other. and. In this particular case, remember, it's not just the player walking up to the character, pressing button and engaging in dialogue. It's also characters talking between one another as they're platforming through the level, evading dangers uh, or maybe entering some sort of a quiet ambient zone where they can have a little, uh, you know, one one on one uh, conversation. The dialogue system has to be flexible. It has to allow both. And I didn't want to create two separate systems, one for or talking to characters in a classical fashion, walk up, press a button, dialogue pops up, and then a whole another dialogue system for the dialogues that the characters have on the go. And both would still have to be able to do things like um, assign quests, tasks, check for items. Uh, both would have to be able to do the same. So I'd literally be creating two dialogue systems just to handle that. I didn't want to do that. And I kind of had a bias towards my graphical dialogue editor tool. So what I decided is to scrap this entire dialogue system, which to be honest, there wasn't really much. And you know what? It's fine. It's, it's good experience to create something different from the norm but um, I kind of made my decision by this point uh, so we scrapped the system and uh, okay so how do we make it compatible right we already have um, uh, the standard dialogue system where we walk up to the character press a button start talking how do I make that work with um, the other system where the characters don't have to walk up to anyone they can just cross a zone and then a dialogue would just start uh, as they're still running around so it wouldn't lock their controls they they're still free to traverse the environment well what I decided to do is um, in Gadot you can create a script and then you can create another script that inherits from that script. This is how I handle NPCs. You see, all the NPCs have to be able to talk, add quests, check quests, give quests, add items, take items, check for items, and a plethora of other stuff. So 
I don't want to go through each and every script for each and every NPC and have to program all of that behavior from scratch. So what I do is I set up one single script called generic NPC. I put all of the generic behavior code into that. And then I make all my characters effectively uh, inherit that script so that those characters could build on top of that functionality whatever additional behavior they have to also be able to do. And not every NPC has to inherit from the script into their own script because there's gonna be a lot of NPCs and then you're off on your merry way. But there will be other NPCs that do have to have additional behavior like traverse the level, interact with objects, perform some sort of scripted events that are particular to that character. So there's going to be things that we have to add to some of the NPCs. And that's where the whole script inheriting uh, feature of Godot comes really handy. And it too came in handy when we had to come up with a solution of how to make our protagonists, two characters, two primary characters, engage in a conversation between one another without walking up to anybody and pressing a button to talk to, uh, to each other, basically. Well, what I've done is I had created another NPC. Uh, it's just a basic kinematic body because all the NPCs have to be kinematic bodies because some of them have to be able to walk around. And I took that NPC and I made him into a singleton and it's invisible. It has no sprites, no areas, no nothing. It's just a kinematic body and it's running the script, its own script that inherits from the base NPC script. So they're always inside of the game everywhere because they are a singleton. They are loaded into the game before we even get to see any of the levels, which means that their NPC dialogue code is present right away. It's present um, right from the get-go. So, what does this mean? Well, all I had to do in this case is just add a couple of additional message types. You see, usually when you engage in a dialogue with an NPC, it locks up your movement code. Uh, all I had to do is just add an extra type of message, which is um, effectively like an auto advance message or an automatic message. Uh, normally, you have to press a button to progress the dialogue because I've had my ears chewed off by uh, uh, a Let's Player playing one of my Game Jam games a while back, complaining that my dialogue was just automatically progressing and they, they were missing out on stuff. Uh, so, you know, that was a, a, a lesson I had to learn. So I allow the players to uh, progress the dialogue themselves. But when two NPCs or two protagonists are talking to each other as they're progressing through the level, I have to make the dialogue progress automatically in much the same way. Um, well, the first example that comes to mind is Half-Life 2. When you meet Alex for the first time, uh, when you talk to Alex, uh, technically you're not really quote unquote talking to Alex. She's just kind of going through the motions of her animations and uh, she's delivering her monologue, uh, laying down the exposition and the setting, everything that you need to know. And you, you're not, you're not, interacting with her as you would in an RPG game where you have to press a button to advance the dialogue forward. So it's more of a, it's more of a passive dialogue that just happens as you go through the level. So those cannot be paused and those cannot be controlled. They have to happen uh, in the order that they happen, in the timing that they're supposed to happen as they've been recorded. So just by simply adding an extra type of message, we have a regular message the one that you can forward uh, yourself. And there's an auto message, the one that as soon as it's done, um, a little pause takes place and then it just automatically moves on to the next message. And that was it. That's all I really had to do in order to make my dialogue system that you would usually see on an NPC to also act as a, as a monologue or dialogue conversation system that characters can have as you're walking through the level and maybe walk through some sort of a trigger zone. That's it. That's all I had to do. So uh, thankfully it wasn't as much work as I um, well was kind of fearing it would be because I remember how much work it was to create the first system. So I was thinking that um, th the solutions would be so drastic that they would end up being yeah, a lot of work. So, you know, um, happy times. So what did we do here? Uh, well, we now have the characters who can uh, trigger a portion of a dialogue uh, when they step into a trigger zone. Um, and that dialogue initially was uh, using 
the number of words in the sentence as a determination of how many seconds the dialogue would stay on the screen. Of course, like more or less um, based on some sort of a factor. Let's say each word would be one second. Uh, and of course, that is something that you would also be able to set inside of the menu of the game uh, where you can increase and decrease the reading speed of the dialogue. The problem there, however, with these types of dialogues that just happen as you go across the level without interacting with anybody, those passive dialogues, is that you might actually end up reaching the end of the level before the dialogue is over. If you, let's say, are a slow reader or, well, I, to be honest, I don't know. It's um, It would mean that I have to somehow stifle the player from being able to go into the next level before the dialogue is over. Uh, but after adding the voice lines, the actual recorded voice lines, um, I started basing the duration of the dialogue message pop-up to be based on the duration of the audio file plus a second or plus half a second, somewhere in the ballpark, so that there, there aren't too long of a pauses between characters speaking, but at the same time, there's a little bit of a pause after the character's done before the dialogue box just kind of goes away. So. Uh, what this allows me to do is have the dialogue play itself out, but also get the level duration or the level size or the level length to be catered towards making sure that you don't finish a level before the dialogue is done. So I can design extra obstacles, um, long jumps, clever little mechanics, um, little micro puzzles that the players have to solve to overcome maybe a gap on the, on the ground they have to jump over. Uh, and while all that's happening, the characters are having the little back and forth. So by putting in the live voice recordings, uh, this has helped me to uh, figure out how I'm gonna handle the dialogues uh, just by listening to the pacing. Now with the dialogue system in place and out of the way, or at least a good chunk of the dialogue system in place, I was a bit more comfortable about going forward with uh, maybe concentrating on game mechanics now. I was consulting the script as to what is supposed to happen for the direction of what I'm supposed to program next. And uh, in this particular zone, in this uh, test chamber, the characters find themselves in uh, a room that's basically ablaze, all the equipment's on fire, they have to get out, they have to uh, keep the briefcase, which is an important object, safe. So what I had decided to do, and I've done this before, was to use Blender to create a mock-up of uh, the uh, prop that's supposed to be in this level, which is a huge teleporter that the players always enter at the end of the level to get transported to the next one. It provides a strange pseudo aesthetic. Um, it's uh, clearly a 2D game, but it's not low enough resolution to be pixel art game. And it's also not large enough resolution to be uh, a large res game, like for example, Rayman Legends, right? Where everything is high definition, but it's also using 3D models rendered in 2D in certain places. So it's, it's kind of an oddball aesthetic right now, or I should say the aesthetic is really non-existent. We're still experimenting with this stuff. But um, I thought that the fastest way to establish some sort of a placeholder model would be to uh, 3D model it uh, and uh, just render it out in 2D plane and place it in the level. And we'll just come back to it later on when we need to create the actual asset. So placeholders for now, uh, part of the new method of doing game development uh, that I'm trying out. In this chamber, according to the script, which is where I outlined the gameplay loop, uh, the characters are supposed to uh, enable a number of generators uh, in order to power on this particular chamber, to bring power to this chamber. Uh, the second challenge is that they have to bring a uh, correctly colored orb into a receptacle in order to uh, in order to provide the coordinates for this teleporter. And while all of that is happening, the briefcase which the characters are carrying back to camp is uh, heat sensitive. And because this entire room is ablaze, the characters, the players, have to keep the briefcase cool. So that means uh, a pool of water that they have to dunk the briefcase in in order to keep the temperature under a particular threshold. So there's a couple of game mechanics that are all combined into one single room. And this is the first room you will experience as you are playing through this demo so maybe it's too much maybe it's 
okay, I, we really have to test this out to see how it feels because we could make the same mechanics be super overbearing and super over the top and very challenging and almost unforgiving. Or we could make them fairly lenient where that makes the gameplay fairly challenging but enjoyable. So the first mechanic I decided to focus on is the keep the briefcase cool mechanic. Now that required some sort of a body of water. According to the script, the players have to pick up the briefcase, jump around a uh, platform around the zone, and then drop the briefcase into a pool of water, which is uh, one of several pools of water within the zone. And the players have to kind of go between these three pools of water and uh, dunk the briefcase to keep it perpetually cool as they are dealing with other responsibilities in this room. Now, this meant that I have to create some sort of a water object. And I have never done anything like this, but having dealt with some very, very simple effects using sine waves, I figured that the easiest way, the path of lowest resistance, as you might think, uh, the easiest way to set up a water is to create a polygon and then take the first uh, set of vertices, the ones that are making up the top surface of the water and simply make their Y coordinate oscillate up and down and up and down and up and down while using their X coordinate as an offset factor so that the water uh, doesn't oscillate up and down all at the same time, but there are very clear waves involved allowing the vertices to oscillate at different rates, uh, creating a very nice wave effect. Now, this is water. So that's all fine and dandy, but we should be able to somehow interact with this water. So this is where I started thinking, oh God, I'm gonna have to involve some physics objects like rigid bodies or uh, with spring joints, or I'm gonna have to involve some pin joints and then chain them all together. And then I have to make a script that's gonna chain uh, all these rigid bodies uh, one after another, reposition them where the, uh, the joints are. And then I have to retarget the joints coordinates, to the coordinates of the rigid bodies. And then I realized, you know what? We could keep it simple and piggyback off of what we've done so far and simply make our water object create an array of vertex offsets. And uh, this array would be based on how many vertices there are in this body of water, minus technically the first one and the last three. Uh, so we do have some rules we have to follow when we're creating these water bodies. The water body has to be rectangular and um, most of the vertices have to be concentrated around the top. And then when we are defining the, let's say the bottom of the uh, water pool, we're not actually gonna follow a shape of the tile set precisely. We're just gonna make a rectangle and uh, be done with it. We'll just make the code ignore the last three vertices, including the first vertice uh, in the offset or the last two vertices technically. So uh, what happens is uh, we place an area node into our water and using some rules that we impose on ourselves when we position the area nodes uh, and position the collision shapes, we can make it so that when the player touches the water, touches the area of the water, we calculate the position of the player across the water surface. And then that position will be divided by how many vertices there are and then floored or rounded, which will essentially give us the ID of the vertice which was the closest to the player when the player touched the water. So we literally convert the position of the player to the index of uh, a vertice. And then we just use that index to talk to that aforementioned array, which is supposed to contain offsets. We put a value into that array, like plus five pixels or minus five pixels, which makes that particular vertice bounce up or down. And then using a little bit of delta, we dissipate the value back to zero. So it just comes back into the original sine wave. So we essentially just have the sine wave providing the initial waves plus the array of offsets that uh, simply make it look like the water is reacting to the player when in reality it's just it's just offsetting it a little bit more um, just 
in the general vicinity where the player happened to be touching the water. I think that is a lot less strenuous on the physics processor uh, than using spring joints. Uh, spring joints might look more believable. Uh, to me, the effect that I got out of here, to be honest, gets the job done fairly well. You know, add a few more particles, uh, maybe play around with the uh, with the waving uh, algorithm or displacement algorithm, but that's that's basically it. I think the uh, water here does the job pretty well. Now, also, due to the positioning of um, uh, our water, the origin of the water body is actually in the bottom left corner of the entire shape, which means we can make the water evaporate by scaling it down across the y-axis. It's simply gonna scale down to the bottom of the water. And of course, the bottom of the water is, a, is at the bottom of the basin, so it's gonna visually look like it is evaporating. So now we have our water that can be evaporated, so we have to keep running around and dunking the briefcase into another body of water. Having established the water effect, now it was time to get the briefcase uh, object into place. Now, this briefcase, I didn't end up creating a sprite for it. I just used two white rectangles just to define the general shape of the briefcase and the handle, uh, applied the, the rigid body shape, uh, co collision shape, and that's it. This was pretty much as far as I was gonna go in terms of uh, a placeholder. Uh, the briefcase had to essentially do two things. It had to be pick upable, so the player has to be able to pick it up, and it has to overheat, which means it has to also detect when it is being dunked into water and cool down as a result. I didn't spend too much time on the user interface for this. I just popped into Krita and defined a small uh, heat gauge. I painted the needle on a separate layer so we can freely rotate it. Uh, there is a very interesting function you can Google for Gadot, uh, which is used for remapping values. You uh, see this function used a lot in embedded systems. I especially like using it with Arduino projects. But um, the way the method works is that you give the method a variable, which contains a value, and you also give the function, uh, the method, a starting and the ending value of the original range and the starting and the ending value of the remapped range. So if you feed it a variable that has a range between uh, negative 16 and positive 60, you can then remap it to a range of negative 80 to positive 80 for example, or negative one to positive one. Uh, it's a very cool function that allows me to do things like rotating dials, indicators, uh, and uh, using various values like uh, 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 health, like speed, like uh, some sort of scalar parameter between zero and one to drive whatever values I want. It's very handy. So what I did is uh, made the needle assume a angle, I think between 160, negative 160 to positive 160 degrees based on how filled up the heat gauge of the, um, of the suitcase was. Now, since we're talking about the user interface, uh, the heat gauge is supposed to tell us how hot the briefcase is that would be considered the piece of the user interface and it has to always stay in front. And something I learned from um, somebody that I'm actually teaching is that you can actually use a canvas layer within all of your child notes and all the canvas layers that are located on layer number one are compounded together to just use that layer. So using more canvas layer nodes, as far as I know, doesn't amount to more performance uh, or more um, render layers being used up. So that was kind of an interesting aspect that is totally not how it works in other engines that I've used, like Game Maker Studio and App Game Kit. Um, so it was actually kind of a game changer for me. So this is going to be this is going to make user interface and pop ups and uh, button prompts to Im be implemented very easily. Uh, it's almost mind boggling. So we ended up using a function that allows us to project the object's global position in the level to local position on a screen using a canvas layer. And that allows us to position user interface nodes to be perfectly lined up with the actual object in the game and yet still be located on top of the gameplay. 
Now this next little bit is uh, just a little detail. It wasn't really necessary to put in, but I thought it would be nice to indicate that the briefcase is currently cooling down by making it emit these puffs of steam. So as soon as you throw it in a body of water, as long as it is being cooled down, it will emit the particles of steam. Now, keeping an eye on the briefcase temperature and keeping it under control, keeping it cool, is supposed to be um, a constant uh, mechanic throughout this particular chamber. So, it doesn't make sense if we only have three pools of water and you run through the three pools of water and then what? Well, either we have to time the entire uh, scene, the entire thing to be kind of a scripted event. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter what you do. As soon as you run out of the water pools, uh, something has to happen, which wasn't really what I was planning according to the script. So that's not it. You see, we needed to get these water pools to constantly be replenished. So I had set up a quick little object that uh, effectively just emulates a, a look of a pipe. It's just a color wrecked um, and uh, a particle uh, system that will be turned on and off whenever there's water coming out of the pipe and the uh, pipe will have an extra export variable specifically meant for um, targeting a particular pool of water. So when the pipe turns itself on, which is done by a timer, there's a, a period of time that the pipe remains off, a period of time that the pipe stays on, and of course a short period of time or any length period of time before the pipe enters its uh, cycle, which allows me to place multiple of these pipes, one for each pool, and make those pipes uh, be offset in time. So there shouldn't be more than one, maybe two pools being filled up with water at any point in time. So by introducing this little delay, this allows us to toggle the pipes on or to set the timers of the pipes to be in such a way where when you are dunking your briefcase into the pool at the very bottom, maybe the pool at the very top gets filled up. And when you run out of water at the bottom and get to the top and dunk the briefcase there, the pool in the middle gets filled up and then the bottom one. And it, it just goes in the cycle in a, an interesting pattern. So this would uh, allow us to make sure that there's always a constant supply of water that the player has to keep an eye out. And because we programmed uh, in export variables, which allows us to change the values of those variables within the inspector rather than having to go into the code every single time, this allows us to experiment with timings and dial things in in such a way where it's just challenging enough but not too tedious or not too close to the game overstate when the briefcase overheats. I've balanced it out more or less where it's uh, fairly challenging right now. I might actually even tone it down next time around. But uh, this means that I can move on to the next part of the gameplay mechanic, which is supposed to happen here, which is us uh, turning on a number of generators in order to provide power to this whole uh, chamber. So there is going to be a number of generators and there are now raccoons fighting in the backyard. Holy cow, what is this? What hellscape am I living in? Seriously, every week there's some family feud between the raccoons and the skunks. Oh yeah, great, here comes the smell. Hey Google, remind me to look up prices on crossbows. Got it, but first you'll have to unlock your device. Oh, fuck's sakes, never mind. Initially, I wanted to borrow the startup mechanic for the generators from a game called Dead by Daylight, where you have to time your button press in just the right moment when the indicator is in the green zone uh, surrounded by a large red zone. If you screw it up, you lose some of the startup progress you've made previously, and if you time it just right, you progress the startup of the generator forward. The problem there, however, is that the generators have to be within reach. They have to be accessible at all times. We can't suspend some generators in the middle of the air so that the player has to jump to it in order to uh, press the button. And of course, if we do suspend the generator, then the user interface that shows you the wheel and the timing uh, indicator would only show up when you're close to it. So not really a great uh, solution. So instead, I decided to go for the button masher where when you get close to the generator, the, the indicator pops up and then you have to mash the button in order to rev up the generator uh, up until it reaches the green zone. And it stays within the green zone for a little bit until it um, starts dissipating a little bit. While the one generator is in the green zone, you're supposed to run your way to the other generator and do the same thing press the button a bunch of times, get it revved up to the green zone, and then run to the third generator. 
do the same process again. Now, the key here is that the generators scattered throughout this level will have different dissipation speeds. So one generator will dissipate really quickly, another generator will dissipate very slowly, and then varying levels of other two generators in the room. So the player has to rev up the generators in just the right order. Uh, now, at the moment, when the player revs up all the generators, I was planning to just bring the power to the entire room. The problem is that technically, if you know which order to boot up the generators in, you could just boot them up right away from the get-go. So this constant maintenance mechanic where you have to run between the generators and keep them revved up becomes a one-time event, which I didn't really want to do because then, well, the the only thing you have left to really handle is the briefcase and the dialing of the uh, the different colored orbs into the receptacle. And at that point, the second player, if you're playing in co-op, is already doing that. So you just have to kind of babysit this briefcase while the other player is doing all the work. So instead, I figured I might go with some sort of a boot up uh, dial, maybe like a power meter. And if you keep all the generators within the green zone, the power meter will start rising, 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 rising. But if one of the generators drops below the green zone, then the progress stops. And if you leave it in that state for long enough, then it's going to start dissipating and stop dropping down. So in that case, it's kind of like a double generator mechanic. It's pretty much the same exact mechanic, just doubled up. First, the generators have to kept, be kept revved up in order to make them deliver power. And second is this dial indicator, which requires all the generators revved up in order for it to bring up its power. So we're kind of uh, just multiplying the same process multiple times in order to get uh, a more elongated effect. So this means that even if the player knows which order to boot up the generators, they still have to keep running around between them to keep them all revved up to the maximum in order for the power to continue build up. The next recording day was the day of our Retroactive Gamers recording session. It was a two-day session and uh, Tim stayed overnight so we can maximize the amount of content we can record in the two-day that we have uh, allocated for this. And uh, for about an hour and a half for both Friday and Saturday, we ended up recording some voice lines for our characters for this demo. Now. As I said in the introduction of this report, we didn't record as much as I thought we would for the three and a half hours that we've recorded for. It took us a little over an hour and a half on a Friday to record the uh, introduction vocals, and it was a pretty strenuous process. By the end of the one and a half hour mark, we actually felt ourselves losing energy, and there was just no sense in recording any further because we just wouldn't deliver the sort of vocal lines we could use in the final project. And if we're doing drafts, I can just record those myself. So I think we barely got through just under 10 pages of script. We had to do multiple takes. We had to revise some of the dialogue because once we started actually reading it out loud, it didn't sound all that great. Now, granted that part I could have prepared for. I could have read out the dialogue myself. I could have recorded myself speaking the dialogue and I'm sure that a lot of things that we ended up changing would have become apparent to me uh, before we ended up doing the recording session. Now, besides that, we also had to figure out how to deliver some of the lines. We had to watch the energy. We had to do proper punctuation, emphasis. We had to do multiple takes for each phrase so that we have more than enough material to work with. So all of that kind of accumulated into taking up quite a decent chunk of time. And that's likely the reason why we didn't make as much progress as I hoped that we would. I'm thinking, however, next time I could be more prepared and we now know what sort of delivery we can expect. So maybe we can make more of a leeway. Next recording session, August. Can't wait. Just to give you a bit of a preview of what the process was like, here's a, a little snippet of how we went about recording this. Now, usually when I record other voice actors, I can sit at the computer and I can organize all the files, I can organize multiple takes, which makes editing those takes later on a lot easier. This time around, however, since I am also one of the voices, 
and the fact that we're doing dialogues meant that it would be a good idea to record some things uh, together as an actual dialogue rather than record all the lines for Tim and then I would record all the lines for myself separately. Um, it probably would have been better to be there in a moment because Tim actually proved to be quite a huge help on getting some of the lines to sound more natural. Um, some of the ideas on refactoring the lines were pretty spot on. So we ended up just hitting record and letting Cubase capture everything that we talked about, all the changes, and I would do all the cutting and arrangement and combining and joining all the takes together uh, in post. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cure will be destroyed anyways. Okay, so that's the last take. That's the beginning yeah. of that sentence. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cube will... The cube. Oh, yeah, the cube. The cube. The cube. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cube will be. <laughs> if we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cure will be destroyed anyways. Let me. Okay, so this is good. And now, if we take a look at the last take. Let me try and dial oh, into yeah, this it's manually. Not, it's not the same what energy the there. It's close, actually. It's not. Let me try and dial the address manually. Okay, so. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cure will be destroyed anyways. Let me try and dial the address manually. Well, it could actually work. Do you want me yeah. just to take one more take, just in case? Yeah, yeah, so that should be fine. Man, I just get second-hand happiness just by watching our previous recording sessions and editing the uh, the material. So, so much fun. <laughs> I have so much fun in these recording sessions. So having done the recording sessions and having waited a couple of days, I had started organizing the recordings. Now, the whole script that we got to record was recorded as one long take. So now it was my job to cut up the individual takes for each sentence and group them together into lanes. This is a special feature that Cubase offers to make it easier to work with multiple takes. The whole process took me a few hours because there were some things I had to chop off. There were a lot of jokes made that I had to cut out. And as I was uh, chopping off all the extra stuff, all the uh, outtakes, I actually thought of something interesting that I could do uh, in this game. So uh, the way the game is structured is that it's a semi-open world or a two-dimensional open world, you know, as open as a two-dimensional game can really be, especially a platformer one. So in this game, we have uh, certain levels and certain zones that are locked away and players have to collect these um, crystals that are like uh, memory fragments, uh, computer memory fragments, which you use as sort of like level unlocking currency. So you collect, let's say, 50 crystals and you can unlock level one um, or some, some sort of a hidden level one, not the actual level one, not the one that has a narrative in it, but some sort of a supplementary level one that maybe has a little mini story or maybe has a shortcut or maybe it brings some benefits later down in the game. So the um, uh, these memory crystals, you collect them by quite literally jumping over them and touching them as you are progressing through the games, through the challenges. You can ignore them, so you're just not going to get the benefits of uh, um, getting access to additional content. Uh, so when you do collect them, they allow you to open up additional zones and reap the benefits. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny if I take the outtakes and the jokes and the memes and whatever shenanigans we uh, did during these recording sessions and we place them in the game as little Easter eggs. Like there's a menu you can go to to take a look at all the crystals and if you take a crystal and drop it into some sort of receptacle, it plays a little audio sample, an outtake, uh, some something dumb being said during a recording session or some funny mistake we made, like when Tim kept saying cube instead of cure. Uh, just a little Easter egg and um, just increase the value of the game that way it's uh, it's like a little window into the process of how the game was made you know besides the obvious you know these videos um something that people can experience from within the game it's kind of like the vinyl records in wolfenstein you can collect these vinyl records if you're attentive enough uh, throughout the level and uh, that unlocks music that you can play from within the menu of uh, wolfenstein so it's kind of that except it's our dumb outtakes or something along those lines so while I was editing and grouping all the takes together, I was kind of putting away the outtakes, just uh, keep them safe, maybe if I decide to go through with this whole uh, Easter egg thing. 
Now this whole cutting process took me I think about three and a bit hours to go through. Uh, I can improve this a little bit if I were to say pause and restart the take markers uh, while I was recording. I might even set up uh, maybe my computer with TeamViewer, uh, my laptop with TeamViewer so I can see the computer and then maybe like a wireless keyboard so I can press uh, stop and record, rewind, uh, uh, use the shortcuts to move the timeline tracker back to the beginning of a take so that I don't have to chop everything up and group everything together. The program will kind of do it automatically because we are resetting the timeline tracker back to the beginning every time we hit record. So this probably would save me a good hour. Uh, to, well, actually, no, considering it took me about three hours to chop up and group everything together, I would say it would save me maybe two and a half hours if I don't uh, delete the outtakes. Having done everything, I had set up the render regions, which allows me to uh, set the zones, a uh, little markers, in and out markers, for the multiple sentences that we read throughout the script. So in this game, I think in order to make the recorded dialogues be compatible with the dialogue system, I have to chop up the dialogue sentences into the small bits, uh, same exact bits that show up in the dialogue boxes in the game. So this is where the current dialogue system I'm using right now is seems like a polar opposite to the dialogue system uh, I developed way back in a whole bunch of dozen videos uh, before this one. You see, the old dialogue system was timer based. Uh, there's a timer that launches in the background and the entire dialogue is split apart into this array of messages and each message has a particular timeline where that message needs to appear, which means the entire dialogue can be one single recording and then I simply set the times where a particular subtitle or particular dialogue message should appear as the audio is being played. Now, in this case, we have something opposite. Instead of having one long dialogue uh, recording, audio recording, and then having to split up the subtitles throughout that dialogue recording, we do the opposite. We make each individual message pop up naturally and that each individual message has each individual audio file that it plays according to whatever that message says. So it seems like there's no real benefit to one or the other, because if we have a one long audio recording, I still have to do the work of chopping up the text, the subtitles in the array, uh, and I don't have the ability to use my dialogue builder to take advantage of the quick dialogue design uh, tool set. Uh, so that's kind of a downside. Uh, or in this case, if I split up the subtitles, uh, the messages into each individual message, uh, I have the ease of use of the Dialogue tool that allows me to very quickly set up these dialogues, but then I have to chop up or render out each individual sentence in Cubase uh, and match them to the dialogue. So it honestly seems like there's an equal amount of work to be done on both fronts. Having finally grouped and organized all the takes together, it was time to pick the right takes, pick the good takes out of all the material that we have available to us. This is honestly where properly recording it using the loopback function and the recording zones would have been uh, a huge time saver. But we pulled through, we chopped up the iffy parts and we substituted with better sounding parts from other takes. We mix and match quite a lot uh, to get the most optimal take, you know, take all the good stuff out of all the takes and make one good one. Now, I'll be frank, we recorded the intro and we recorded the... Um, uh, build up to the introduction to this one character we're supposed to run into. I had only chopped up, organized, mixed, and uh, picked the takes for the introduction. There's still another half of the recording waiting for me to do the edits on. So this is a lengthy process. Every time I sit down to write some music, every time I sit down to do some audio work, I get, um, I almost lose track of time. I get lost in the process and it baffles me 
how little progress you make in a certain amount of time compared to say programming or animation, 3D, texturing, asset creation, even the script writing part doesn't take as long. You tend to uh, create a lot more content for the amount of time you spend um, generating music. It's baffling just how much work audio takes up. This is why it's important to well, make friends with audio people and uh, you know, if you're on good terms with them, they can help you out to get your project out the door because this is, this is a lot. There's a lot to be done here. And coming back to the whole process of iteration, uh, I would spend an hour, maybe two hours coming up with uh, some sort of a base idea for a soundtrack and it's probably not even gonna be the primary idea I'm gonna go with. I'll most likely come back, you know, next day or at the end of the week or the next week and I'll just write another idea. Chances are it might come out better. So that means the first two hours uh, would pretty much be delegated to either we categorize it as experimentation, learning experience, or we might come back to that soundtrack and uh, finish it and use it somewhere else. So very rarely nowadays uh, do I create the music that I want to use right away. But there's something else that happens, especially with music. I tend to come up with ideas by writing music first. It almost eliminates the whole problem of the fact that you take multiple, you do multiple takes, multiple revisions, multiple ideas, and then you choose the right one. Where in my case, I write the music first and then I create the idea around that music. That happens to me a lot. Maybe it's because my whole game dev journey started with music, but um, whenever I open up sound patches, uh, virtual instruments, and I click on the random patch and I listen to it, sometimes, most often than not, it will actually inspire me for some really interesting level uh, mechanic or really interesting world image, uh, an atmosphere, uh, a quest, uh, a character that we can talk to. Um, and I would just forget what it is that I set out to do. For example, I set out to write action music. It's like, no, 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 this sounds really cool. Oh, this soundtrack would sound really great in some sort of like a Buddhist temple area, uh, which is actually what happened to me when I was writing music for the Child of Ether project. You're going to hear that in a little bit. So that's the process. Um, sometimes a lot of the work that's done, especially with audio, just kind of gets tossed out. And um, that's that's a lot of time. That's a huge chunk of the project time. So yeah, folks, if you can afford to get some royalty free music that fits your project, by any means, go for it. If you can find somebody who can do sound effects and sound work, absolutely, that will definitely take off a huge load off your shoulders. After setting up the zones, which would allow me to export each individual sentence as a separate file, I gave the vocals for our characters just a little bit of treatment, a little bit of a cue work, a little bit of a compression, just to give them more energy, just to give them more pop, um, cut off some of the low frequencies, just so we don't have too much of a noise at the bottom end, and uh, just adjusted the cues just a tiny bit to treat the vocals, get rid of the nasty frequencies, boost the range uh, between 1K and 4K uh, kilohertz. Um, that's where most of the speech clarity comes from, so we play around with that a little bit. A uh, little bit of compression to give the vocals some pop, and we just batch exported all of the vocals, all of the sentences, um, the zoning feature in Cubase, which is also available in Reaper, and I know that for sure because I use Reaper on the game development machine when I don't have the time to go downstairs and boot up Cubase and launch all that hardware. Um, you have this feature called regions, which allows you to number the regions and also name the regions, which means when you export, when you do the batch exporting, it will export each individual file, but it will also provide the names of those files. So you can use regions or zones to uh, label what each and every file is talking about. So I would usually use just a couple of words from that particular sentence to 
uh, as the name of the rendered file in order to indicate what part of the dialogue that file is about. It just helps me out um, to keep things organized and not have to remember things like indices and numbers. Having done with treating the vocals and exporting the vocals, preparing them for the game, we return back to our development machine and we continue programming the dialogue system. Now that we have the vocal lines, we can implement them into our NPC, into our narrator, so to speak, the object that handles the characters talking to each other as they're running through the level. Uh, each and every message uh, is capable of playing back a specified sound. I specifically programmed the web-based dialogue builder to include a extra text field inside of each message called audio. So you can play the voice recording of that particular dialogue message in your game, or you could play some sort of a sound effect. Uh, for example, there's a particular dialogue message that is responsible for granting us a new quest. So when a new quest is granted, we could quite literally make it play a particular sound and uh, that sound could be different for every quest. That's just optional ways that you can utilize that particular feature. You don't have to use it that way. In my case, I just used it to play back a particular sound file. Now, I didn't bother to open the dialogue for essentially a conversation that's about 15 messages long. I just populated the paths to the sound files um, inside of um, the Visual Studio code right away. Now, this is where I started thinking about uh, localization because I am supplying a hard-coded path to a particular file, a particular voice recording. So that means that um, if I wanted to make it play the same voice line, but in Spanish or uh, French or German or Russian or any other language, I would have had to go into the JSON file and I would have to change it there for each region. I could do that or I figured, not a big deal. In that little path, in the sound path, there's actually a folder, a string section that represents the language uh, of that recording, ENG for English. Now, if I wanted to do localization, we could create other folders for Spanish, for French, for German, for Russian, for Japanese, whatever the localizations we decide to do, if we decide to do them. And all I have to do to enable localization is I have to program into the game to simply take the path and sub substitute ENG uh, forward slash ENG forward slash with forward slash uh, German forward slash or forward slash French forward slash. And that's it, localization done. Uh, now that is only pertaining to the sound file. So we have a very flexible, very easy to implement solution for localization for audio files. For text, however, not so much. The text is hard coded within the JSON. So we might want to come up with a solution um, for that otherwise. At this point, all that was left to do was to substitute our code that uh, determined the duration of the message, because prior to adding these voice recordings, the duration of the message was determined by the amount of words multiplied by some sort of a second interval. Now, the duration of the message would be based on the duration of the audio recording, plus like half a second. At this point, I also noted that the level was just way too large and uh, players would have to travel quite far away from one another. So we did a little bit of refactoring, a little bit of reorganization, made the level a bit more compact, and that was basically it. And here is what we got as a result. There it is. I told you we'd find the phase gate here. Okay, great. How are we going to operate it, genius? It's fine. We'll just improvise. I saw Adam trick one of these things into gating us outside the facility. We'll be fine. Are you completely insane? You're gonna get us killed! You got any better ideas? Because I don't think this briefcase is meant to withstand this heat. It'll ruin the cure. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cure will be destroyed anyways. Let me try to hack into it and dial the address manually. We don't have time. All we need is to jumpstart the generators, pick out a few plasma cylinders, and we can force this thing to get us out of here. Come on! Don't do anything stupid. We'll boot this thing up and dial the address by hand. And whatever happens, don't let the briefcase overheat. I won't.
So granted, it sounds a little goofy when kind of played in silence with no other sound effects, because then all you can really do is concentrate on all the imperfections and all the nuances of the vocals, but something changes when you start adding music. And because we now have a fully recorded timed set of dialogue that we can time the music to, it was exactly that that I wanted to do next. I knew when the dialogue starts, I knew how long the dialogue's gonna take. And in the script, there's a particular note that I left to myself to write the music in such a way where the moment uh, my character says the last sentence, which is, I won't, the music will kick up. And here is the result. There it is. I told you we'd find the phase gate here. Okay, great. How are we gonna operate it, genius? It's fine, we'll just improvise. I saw Adam trick one of these things into gating us outside the facility. We'll be fine. Are you completely insane? You're gonna get us killed! You got any better ideas? Because I don't think this briefcase is meant to withstand this heat. It'll ruin the cure. If we teleport in the middle of a wall, the cure will be destroyed anyway. Let me try to hack into it and dial the address manually. We don't have time. All we need is to jumpstart the generators, pick out a few plasma cylinders, and we can force this thing to get us out of here. Come on! Don't do anything stupid. We'll boot this thing up and dial the address by hand. But whatever happens, don't let the briefcase overheat. I won't. So this is the draft of the song that I wrote uh, specifically after we recorded the dialogues and I just opened OBS and recorded uh, this part of the dialogue while the gameplay was playing. And um, I figured drum and bass is a pretty safe way to go for a high action music, especially kind of borrowing some ideas from the game that inspired this entire project, which is Super Meat Boy. There's a lot of really interesting ideas uh, that I can kind of piggyback off of and uh, write my own music. This soundtrack was also written in a, a different approach in mind where uh, instead of coming up with chord progressions to write up the composition, the arrangement, instead I treat the chords as individual melodies stacked on top of one another and living in harmony. It's an approach that I learned way, way, way back about many years ago and never bothered to actually try to implement it or elaborate on it and only recently been reminded of it by a video by Adam Neely who is a YouTuber and a phenomenal jazz musician and he has a lot of very useful advice on writing music so I highly recommend you check out his channel. Now this is of course not the first idea that I've written. There is another particular soundbite for an action soundtrack that I've written before I had established uh, any dialogue recording. So uh, for what it's worth, it does sound like it has some sort of an idea in it. Uh, I could, again, come back to it, complete it and repurpose it for another zone. <laughs>
that's basically it to this particular iteration of the soundtrack. As you can see, it's almost like a vertical slice in of itself. It's just enough information to get the general idea of what the soundtrack is. And at this point, I would either say, okay, this is good, I can continue working with it, or I would start a new project and just uh, work on a different idea. In any case, this is all the progress that we have made in the past two weeks on the Artag Rise project. I would say that it's more progress than I've done in half a year before I resumed doing these little progress reports. So you know what? Maybe these are actually of benefit. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, we are going to move on to the last game, Child of Ether. So this part of the report is going to be just a little bit different. Uh, Child of Ether probably got the least amount of uh, time, development time this week, because, well, I usually work on it on Fridays. And last Friday, we had the Retroactive Gamers recording session. So that was out the window. And that only left a couple of hours this Friday to get some progress done. So all that we've done is write a little bit of music and make a few props. That's just about it. So for this last bit, instead of picking out another royalty-free soundtrack and narrating a bunch of explanation of what I'm doing, I'm just going to play the music that I wrote and show you the footage of the props that I've made. Now, I started editing this video a little bit too late today. It's two in the morning on a Sunday, so I'm gonna leave you with this. I hope you've enjoyed, and I hope to see you next week for the next content report.